So thank you for coming this morning. I'm Chad Stebbins, and it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Rebecca Mauser, who is in her 10th year already at Missouri Southern. She came here in 2014. She is an associate professor of English. She received her Ph.D. in medieval literature from the University of Missouri. She specializes primarily in Old English literature, oral tradition, and 14th century romance. While at Missouri Southern, she has taught early British literature, linguistics, writing, and all sections of English comp. Her own scholarly work has appeared in journals such as Studies in Medieval and Renaissance Teaching. Her current research focuses on manuscript culture in England in the Middle Ages and its material connection to oral tradition. This is her third time presenting for one of our theme semesters. She'll never break Jim Lyle's record of, of 20 theme semesters. <laughs> but uh, she, she did present during the Great Britain semester of 2016 and the Nordic semester of 2018. So without further ado, let me give you Dr. Rebecca Mauser. Thank you so much, Chad. Um, I just want to thank you and um, International Studies for, for having me today and for helping me to um, make it to oh, yeah, there it goes. Um, Trinity in, uh, College in Dublin this summer to be able to see the manuscript. Of course, no one sees it outside of its glass box anymore unless you're super important and I am not yet there in the world. Um, and I actually will use that to say that I am not technically trained as a Celticist. I'm kind of the closest thing we have on campus um, to a medieval Celticist. And I did take a class on the Book of Kells online with um, one of the curators a few years ago to the manuscript. So um, I will mention that the, oh, I have a, this is the, the long library, the long room of the library in Trinity. It is currently now under renovation, so I got in just under the wire to be able to visit. Um, I've listed a few useful websites because now the entire manuscript has been digitized and the general public should have access to it. And so the first one is really just the um, library um, link to the book and then um, the visitor site in case you ever get to go to um, that particular site. And then the last one is to the digital collection where you should be able to um, access. And how do I? The last one. Yeah, thank you. And I'm just going to pull up this last one because when you first come into it, it's not easy to see where the digital um, collection would be. But if you click under subject where it says Bible, Gospels, um, Book of Kells, then that will take you into um, the digitized images of the manuscript in case you are so inclined. Okay, and then I can go back. And so I just want to start off with some specifics about the Book of Kells. And I will say that I tend to run these kind of luxury like for class. Um, so feel free to stop me if you have questions or if I go too quickly through something. Um, I sometimes do that as I'm lecturing. And then please feel free to come in and out as you need to as well because I feel like this is like class. Um, on this particular slide, so I've put 8th century, and of course we have a little bit of a question mark there because it seems like it was begun late in the 8th century, so 790s um, in possibly Iona and not Kells, um, and then finished later at um, the monastery in Kells. It's one of the few manuscripts that, remain, that survive from this period. Um, and it's a gospel book that's based on the Latin Vulgate by, of course, St. Jerome. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about its provenance and why we don't know too much about that later on. So I've mentioned that it is made of vellum. Vellum is um, calfskin, so a lot of times we talk about parchment in general, um, but sometimes specifically vellum, which does refer to calfskin. And... Um, they speculate, estimate that about 159 calfskins were used in order to complete the project. Um, 
And there are a lot of differences in the skins um, based on like color and thickness. So as you go through the book, sometimes you can tell, of course, which is the hair side versus the flesh side of the page. Um, and it's not quite as consistent as you might think in like a, no a new book, right, on paper. Um, so keep that in mind. Usually the flesh side is a little whiter than the hair side, which will be more yellow um, in, its, in its coloring. And of course the text itself also has some flaws. A lot of times we think about manuscript culture um, being flawless in a lot of ways, but um, there are many flaws. There are a couple of areas that have been stitched um, to close holes or tears in the manuscript. And then of course, just some eye skips that are usual from scribes in the monastery and the scriptorium. Um, it's made up of 38 choirs, which choirs is just kind of how the parchment sheets are folded and grouped together. Um, and it has been rebound five times in its life. So I've listed those years here. And it's a, a pretty important to think about because um, the results of the rebindings mean that sometimes the pages have been trimmed, um, which means we lose material. And a couple of these rebindings were pretty disastrous to the manuscript in general. So in 1826, um, when they rebound, they actually washed the book, um, which caused a shrinkage and a loss of some of the color. And unfortunately, instead of like leaving it as is, the um, preservationists repainted those pages, um, not following, of course, some of our more modern kind of techniques for thinking about restoration of manuscripts. And then in 1874, um, that particular rebinding was done in London, and that caused a lot of distress to um, Trinity College and to the Irish who were worried that it would remain in um, Great Britain's collection instead of returning home to Trinity College. However, fears unfounded, it did come back and return to them. And then the last one in 1953, that particular rebinding um, divided it into four gospel books. And now it's on rotation pretty much with one of the four always being on display at the college and the other three um, kind of being at rest so that they can kind of, of keep that on rotation and expose it to less light um, to, to try and keep it from deteriorating further. Um, currently, it has 350 leaves. 340 leaves, and we'll talk about um, what happens with those approximately 10 leaves that we think are missing from the beginning, and maybe 10 to 12 leaves that are missing from the end of the manuscript. And usually there are 17 to 19 lines of text per page. We think it was the work of four scribes. Um, I will start this by saying it's a little difficult sometimes to identify scribes, and it's because they are trained to have a uniformity of hand um, in whatever particular um, hand they are using at the time. But we, we do think that there were four scribes. We've labeled them A, B, C, D. And again, um, scribes don't sign their work, and they work as part of a scriptorium in a particular monastery. And also, since they are trained to be uniform, this is why we are not 100% certain of the provenance of this manuscript either, thinking that it began in, in Iona in Scotland. And I think I have a map here, so you can see kind of the close proximity between that and Kells. Um, scribe A, who we label Scribe A, we think did all of the Gospel of John. It's actually the only of the four Gospels that was completed in one hand, um, and also began both of the preliminary texts of the Gospel book. Um, scribe B seems to be kind of the finisher and maybe the driver of the project to finish it. Um, did the canon tables, and throughout we can tell where this particular scribe has um, attempted to complete and finish passages in, in the Gospels. And then C and D, most of Matthew, Mark, and Luke is attributed to scribes C and D. And of course, there are some famous scribes that we do know names of at the time, um, but we don't assume that they are one of the, the scribes that worked on this particular manuscript. We also mentioned that there are maybe three artists. Um, they speculate actually between two and four. You would probably need two or three artists to do the different work that is necessary. Um, tentatively, they've been labeled the goldsmith, 
um, the portrait painter and the illustrator. Um, and when we look at some of the images, um, you'll see kind of why there's a, a designation of different duties for this. I'll also mention that in general, um, the process for developing a manuscript at the time in the scriptorium would be that you would have all of the text done by a scribe first, often working from an exemplum, and then it would go to the rubricator if rubrication was necessary, and that is the red text that's added into manuscripts. A lot of times those red capitals, if you've seen any manuscripts, um, and then it would go to the illuminator who does more of the, the artistry, painting, and, and gold leafing. So. Um, this particular hand is called Insular Magiscule. And um, in the fourth century, what we think is that Roman script um, was introduced probably through Britain. And by the sixth century, it has developed as a distinctive style. It is called insular because it is, of course, limited to the island of um, what's now currently the UK and Ireland. Um, and so it develops separately from the hands that develop on the continent. But that doesn't mean that those monasteries are separate from their influences and interactions together. It just means that in some ways we can at least know the general area of the kind of provenance of a manuscript based on those hands. Um, and I've put up an example of some of what the um, insular majuscule would look like. And one of the big characteristics is the fact that the ascenders and descenders, so that's like when you write an F or a D or a B, they will usually be uniform across the page instead of rising above and below the line. Um, it seems to be like a Northumbrian influence, which in England that means north of the Umber River, and so northern England um, is where we think um, some of the style developed, and it's used for important works. Um, minuscule will develop later. It's more of like a cursive style and um, for more everyday use. But here you can see um, up close some of the page from, from the Book of Kells, and you can see that, oops, there's not a lot of height or length to those ascenders and descenders. Okay. And so I just wanted to include a little bit of this map so that we could see where Iona and Kells are um, and thinking about kind of their connections in terms of those monastic communities. Um, we say it's produced in one or both of these different communities. And it's connected especially to St. Columba, who was born in um, 521, 522 Common Era and died around 597. And so what I wanted to do also was think about that these are not developed on their own in a vacuum. There are actually several gospel books that do share certain characteristics um, with this particular text and have connections to Ireland especially. And so in terms of gospel books and manuscripts, I've listed out um, four particular ones. Um, so the Book of Duro is a little earlier, and then um, as is the Lindisfarne Gospels, those are sometimes books that people are familiar with, um, especially if they've done any medieval research. And then there are several monasteries across both England and the continent that have connections to, Engl to Ireland. And so on this page, what I wanted to do is just kind of highlight pages from a couple of those gospel books so that when we look at pages of the Book of Kells, hopefully you can see some of this connection in the images. Um, so for the Lindisfarne Gospels, you can see especially some of the serpentine and interlace construction as over here as well. And the fact that for the Book of Duro, this is like one of the kind of carpet pages almost, kind of like you see in the Book of Kells. <coughs> Um, and also here I've pulled the Cairo pages specifically from both Lindisfarne and from the Book of Kells. So the Book of Kells is here, this larger image, and then the Lindisfarne Gospels over here to the side. Um, and so you can see a lot of connections in how both of those Greek letters appear on the page. And of course this is a symbol for Christ in the manuscripts. And, um, 
this one in particular will talk about lozenges, which are these um, four-sided characters, and again, a representation, a symbol of Christ. Just pause a little bit on that. Um, some history, too. So um, in some ways, the Irish saw themselves at this time as, as uniquely Christian. So they are um, converted to Christianity much earlier than the groups in um, England. And they see themselves as uniquely connected to Rome, um, as the St. Columba himself described in a letter to Boniface, that the inhabitants of the world's edge and followers of Saints Peter and Paul. Um, in the fourth century is when their conversion process really starts, and then of course completed with St. Patrick in the fifth century, and kind of solidifies that, that Christianity in Ireland. There are some differences in their particular brand of Christianity than what happens even in neighboring, neighboring England. It causes a lot of rifts um, between some monasteries and the church. Um, later writers such as Bede will write about the Easter debate. Um, and of course, it's usually settled eventually in Rome's favor, not in um, how Ireland was constructing the date of that movable feast. Um, also, the style of their tonsure hairstyle was different at mon monasteries in Ireland, and they were organized under abbots instead of bishops. So as mentioned before, St. Columba, he is a central figure, and the reason he plays in here is because they um, theorize that this particular gospel book was put together in celebration of um, his kind of uh, bicentenary, bicentenary. Um, so he moves to Scotland in 561, and then in 563, he becomes the abbot of Iona, right? And so this is why we theorize that the manuscript was begun there in celebration of um, the bicentenary of his death and also to coincide potentially with a new shrine there. But unfortunately, some things have happened um, at the monastery that, that create difficulties for keeping the manuscript there and also for finishing the project if it was indeed begun there. So in 745, we have the first um, de documented attack of what we label as the Vikings um, in Iona. And they come again in 802 and in 806. Um, and so if in, 17, in 797, the Book of Kells is commissioned, then it is no longer safe to stay there. Um, a lot of times what would happen in these raids from the, the Viking groups is that they would choose monasteries, not because they are anti-Christian, but because that is a center of wealth and material in the area. And a lot of manuscripts, of course, the gold leafing is real gold, and so they would strip the gold leafing and toss the manuscripts a lot of times. right? And so the Book of Kells is moved and um, to the Kells County Meath Monastery, who's founded by monks who fled Iona. So in the 11th century, we postulate that it was enshrined in some kind of golden decorated cover, <laughs> which means um, that in 1007, we have our first recorded mention of this particular gospel book, and it's because it's been stolen. Um, but it is recovered after, and this is directly from the annals, like two months and 20 nights. So they were very specific in how long it was gone. Um, but the problem is that we theorize, of course, that this was the loss of the beginning and the ends of the manuscript. So if you remember from, from the first slide, there was that idea of 10 leaves or folios of potentially missing from the beginning and the end. Um, a lot of scholars theorize it was at this moment, right? So it didn't come back to them in its completed form. So in 1211, Kells is incorporated into the Diocese of Meath, and then in 1641, during um, the Irish Rebellion against the Protestant settlers, the Kells itself is seriously damaged, not the book. Um, and so about 10 years later, the book is sent um, to Dublin for safekeeping and um, given, presented to Trinity College, where it remains. And so I wanted to spend some time also on the contents of the book. Um, this first page that you have is the first folio that we have of it in its current um, kind of states. And of course, this particular folio has been damaged. Um, it contains a kind of 
defective and abbreviated list of Hebrew names. Um, it's incomplete, and it seems to be based on, of course, St. Jerome's um, work, but it is, again, damaged and, and incomplete. And it also shows you, you know, just the wear that happens to manuscripts. So, of course, some of the, the ink has faded and is rubbed off or been scraped off um, and is missing there. So, in particular, starting in about 331, Constantine actually orders the creation of 50 ornamented gospel books. And in that order, it kind of sets and codifies what will be in the contents of those particular manuscripts. And so we do see some uniformity across them, no matter which monastery is producing them, and as even as later time fo follows. So they typically begin with canon tables, and these are lists of passages um, that show kind of the shared passages across the four Gospels so that you can kind of compare content because, of course, we know that there are differences between each of um, the evangelists' kind of sharings of the life of Christ. And um, those canon tables are often based on the one from um, the early, like, or the mid-third to fourth century from Eusebius. Then the Brevis Causa is um, the list of, of chapters and, and content, and then the Argumenta is a preface that aims to characterize each of the evangelists and um, kind of discern the meaning behind those particular texts. And so those will precede the four um, Gospels themselves. And so here I just wanted to show you um, the image of a couple of these canon tables that precede it, and you can see kind of the, the wealth of illumination. Um, in a lot of medieval manuscripts, we don't have so much decoration and illumination in those particular manuscripts, but a lot of that is saved and used for, of course, religious texts and gospel books. Um, we'll talk about it later, but it looks very golden here in many ways. Um, there is no actual gold leafing in the Book of Kells. They use a particular pigment for it instead. And we'll talk about that later because it's a fun fact. Um, okay. There are also um, kind of some additional things inside of the Book of Kells besides those uh, particular pieces that every gospel contains on folio 289 verso. So folios are just fancy name for page, and then verso and recto is because it's the left-hand side or the right-hand side of the page, right? And so on 289 verso, there is a poem that seems to be added in the 15th century about the book itself. Um, also on that page is where a Protestant rector um, named Richard White seems to have recorded different events like famines and plagues and wars and also a conversion warning. Um, so they do often use their gospel books as record keeping at different um, churches as well. And um, the first labeling of it as the Book of Kells is in 1621. And that's when it first becomes referred to as the Book of Kells. So I want to pause a little bit and talk about the artistic motifs, um, because a lot of the class that I took really was working through what these images are doing and um, kind of the different connections that we see between both Celtic and Germanic and more Mediterranean Coptic kind of, of influences on the piece. And so in our insular style of these manuscripts, you have spiral motifs especially. Those are often attributed to um, kind of the Celtic art style. Then you have a lot of abstracted and intertwined animals and people. Um, and that's often attributed as like one of the Germanic conventions that comes, of course, with the Angles and Saxons and Jutes who, who do come to England. And then the ribbons plated together that's seen as more Mediterranean or Coptic. Um, and a lot of these kind of interweavings of those particular styles can be seen um, in the pages. And so we'll talk about each of these in turn, kind of what the carpet pages look like and are doing, and also maybe the, the evangelists themselves, especially like their symbols, um, how they're equated, and the animal motifs that happen, as well as some of the symbols that you see pretty um, regularly across the pages. 
And so the first one is that kind of what we call interlace style. And I've put together on this slide a conglomeration of different places that it does appear. So the first one is from the Book of Kells. This is on 40 Verso in Matthew. And you can see this interweaving that goes down the side of the page. And especially some of it is, if you can see the faces, um, it's like the intertwined animal and human um, imagery that we talked about. And you can see this also even in some of the crosses on the sides. This is the Ruddle Cross in Scotland. Um, and so you see that intertwining here. And then this is one of the Sutton Who England um, finds. And so I've labeled that as Germanic because I have um, gone away from using the term Anglo-Saxon. It's been a little problematic in our field of medieval studies. Um, and so instead, it's kind of the Germanic peoples who come to England. It's a style that they, they continue to use. Sutton Who is, of course, one of the famous ship burials. If you've watched the Netflix show, The Dig, that is um, this particular find. And most of those are housed at um, the British Museum. Um, down on the, the bottom corner, they do have kind of outlined what's going on in um, those particular interlacings, like what animals and such seem to be represented, if you're interested. Um, and then these are the carpet pages. And so again, the carpet pages seem to combine some of those insular features with uh, more Coptic features, which is kind of like Mediterranean, North African, Egyptian, Christian church. And the reason I like to pause here is because a lot of times we downplay the connections between different cultures in the medieval period. Um, but I think that here, just these pages, um, they probably look very Byzantine to many of us. Um, and perhaps maybe even connected to the Arab world. And, and I think that there is kind of a misconception about the connections that are happening across Europe and, and the Middle East during this time period. And so we can see some of those influences. In the Gospels, um, each of the Gospels seem to be separated by um, sometimes carpet pages plus the portrait of that particular evangelist. Um, and maybe some other um, illuminated pages as well. So these are kind of dividing pages for each of the Gospels. As well as are these portraits. And the portraits and um, the carpet pages are all often full of a lot of symbolism and imagery as well. So we talked a little bit about the lozenge and you can see kind of the holding of the book is in that same shape. Um, the lozenge is often seen as a symbol for Christ and connected sometimes to like the four corners of the earth as well. Sorry, making sure on my notes. Get ahead of myself. Yes, so thinking about the four elements and oft oftentimes too, like in this pit particular image, we have it connected with the book, so thinking about the Word of God. And in this, um, I just want to pause a minute on these particular images because there are two kind of Christian traditions um, at the time that are developing, and it deals with images of holy figures and symbolism, and it's an icon iconoclasm debate. And so you find that what happens is that it centers on the second commandment about graven images. Um, and so the image of figures um, is often prohibited in certain parts of the church. And the Book of Kells seems to be in the middle straddling those divides. So it's using both the symbols and a couple of images. Um, however, it has moved away from... Um, particularly using narrative images. There are only three in the entire piece instead of several that were more popular in the 6th century, but by the 8th century had fallen kind of out of favor. And so the last slide of the, of the presentation, I do have um, those three narrative images. One is the Virgin and, and Child. One is a portrait of Christ. So you can see that they have incorporated that even with the, the symbolism that they are using um, and again, it's like they are split between kind of the Eastern and Western um, division on this debate about icons. So the Byzantine East 
was using figures, but the West was straying, um, trying to refrain from using actual figures in their representations. So. We also find in the division um, of these particular Gospels an overview that will include all four of the evangelists together in terms of their symbols. And so um, Matthew is often portrayed as a man or an angel. Um, the man kind of keeps his, because his account begins with the humanity and lineage of Christ. And then Mark is often portrayed as a lion whose voice is crying out in the wilderness. Um, Luke is a calf or an ox um, because he begins with the priest, uh, Zechariah, and they are the priests, of course, who make the animal sacrifice. And then John is often portrayed as the eagle. Um, he's like the mystical gospel. And with the animals, you'll find that there's a lot of animal imagery within the manuscript itself. Um, and I brought along in case anyone has questions later, because I don't know them all offhand. But during the Middle Ages, they, of course, had bestiaries where they kept track of um, different medieval beasts and what they represented. And so um, they are a lot of fun. But um, we will see. I think it's the next slide. Uh -huh. Yes, I like when I know what's coming next. Um, in one particular page from the book of Matthew, there is a peacock representation. And um, here, the peacock represents Christ and is supposed to be like um, connected to his incorruptible body. But that is not necessarily the full um, and usual meaning of the peacock, which is often kind of focused on its terrible cry of its voice um, and the toughness, toughness of its uncookable, unpalatable flesh. So beautiful, but disgusting to eat. Um, and so in some traditions, it gets kind of incorporated with the incorruptibility of the body. And then over on um, 72 verso, also in the book of Matthew, you have this, this is a lion, in case you couldn't tell. Um, <laughs> we have to do a lot of, of postulating of what these are. Um, a lion, and of course, it's um, usually the first treated in these bestiary accounts. Um, and it's the longest and most elaborate, usually, in terms of its description, and often equated with Christ. So, But all kinds of medieval beasts. I usually bring it to class, and I'm so glad that now, with Harry Potter, I never have to explain basilisks to anybody anymore. <laughs> um, and then kind of like my last couple of slides, and then I'm happy to answer questions. Um, I think we'll have about 10 minutes for that. Um, and I'm happy to expand on any of this material that I, that I can. Um, so the material and productions, I just want to point out that at this time, it seems rare that there is a lot of color illumination. We have many manuscripts that just have like black illumination, um, not a lot of color. But again, that just might be because of survival, not necessarily because it is as rare as we think. Um, but they've identified about 10 different pigments through um, kind of chemical profiles. And I have my notes somewhere about the two methods that they use, because they went into great detail about it to ensure that we knew that it was um, harmless to the actual manuscripts themselves. Um, but of course, there are two different versions of black um, pigments. One is like lamp or carbon black, right? So that is kind of the residue left by burning the lamps, right? Um, and then oak slash iron gall, so that is the crushing of of those little galls on oak leaves stains terribly. I took a manuscript workshop one time and we all had to um, use oak gall ink um, and we're stained for weeks. <laughs> you just have to wait it out. <laughs> um, they also use like red lead for some red inks. They use a lichen called um, orsine, I think it's called, and it's like a purplish pink. There's gypsum and indigo. There are two shades of green. Um, I will say this one, the Virgo, um, is a combination of two of the other pigments. I um, can't remember right offhand. I think it's the orpiment and, and gypsum together. They do use woad for blue. Um, originally, it was theorized that it was lapis lazuli, which is often used, but um, further chemical profiles revealed that it's woad. Um, and then orpiment. 
This is the beautiful yellow that looks like gold throughout the entirety of that manuscript. Like, shall we look back at how much it shows up? All over the place, right? And so I just point that out because it is highly toxic. It contains high levels of arsenic. Um, and so yes, probably monks would not have had as high of a life expectancy if they were using a lot of the orpiment, which of course they would not have known at that time necessarily. Um, but they have done tests on bodies that they have found of both monks and nuns um, to, in thinking about scriptorium issues. Um, one, to prove that nuns were also literate and were used in the scriptorium. We have found several um, bodies where they, the teeth are stained and running tests of those stains, they are common um, pigments that are used in different manuscripts, right? And how many of us have not like touched our teeth with a pen or something, so. Um, I also wanted to, again, highlight that these manuscripts are not produced all in a single phase of activity. It takes a lot of time and um, a lot of material to actually complete them. And so a lot of times multiple scribes, because like one scribe's lifetime isn't enough to complete a project, depending on which projects are commissioned at which times. And then these are those um, famous kind of narrative images that are in the Book of Kells as well. I thought I should include them so that you could see them since they didn't figure in in the rest of my talk. Um, but this one is probably one of the most popular ones that if you Google the Book of Kells, it's often the one that comes up. Um, and then of course there is the portrait of Christ and the temptation of Christ as well. You can see Satan over there in his black angelness. So, um, and I think that that, yes, that is all that I have prepared, prepared, but as I said, we have 10 minutes and I'm happy to answer questions about the book if I can or other aspects of manuscript culture. I've got a microphone. And if you don't want to use the microphone too, I can always just restate if we need to for the online audience. I was just wondering um, why they're called carpet pages. Mm, excellent. I'm going to pull those back up so that we can. So when you look at them, they do look kind of like Persian rugs, right? So they do look like carpets, um, thinking about those images. And again, that interaction between different cultures, I think, to get these particular images. Um, and also they are just symbols and such, no text on the page and no um, kind of, well, I won't say no people representations because of course there are some people hanging out here um, on the page. But yeah, so it's kind of because visually they represent and look like a carpet. Okay. Next question. So it was uh, called the Book of Kells because primarily it was made almost entirety in the monastery in the town of Kells, but it seems to me it was made in a variety of places. I'm surprised why it called that. Yes, and so a lot of manuscripts are often titled and named based on where they are found, not necessarily where they are produced. Um, so for example, in Old English manuscripts, which I'm much better um, at doing, um, we have the Exeter book, and it is, of course, kept in the cathedral at Exeter, and that's where, um, but not necessarily produced there. Um, and then the Beowulf manuscript is often labeled Cotton Vitellus um, A something. I can't remember the full off the top of my head, but Cotton Vitellus, it's because the Beowulf manuscript was a part of Sir Robert Cotton's collection. He was an antiquarian in the 17th century. And um, unfortunately, he liked his manuscripts to be very uniform on a bookshelf. And so he did a lot of trimming of them before he bound them. Um, and his, uh, man, his house was called Ashburnham which seems like you don't want to call your big manor Ashburnham because then it does catch fire. And um, much like what happened with Notre Dame when they realized they could not save the structure, they started saving the artifacts inside. Um, this is why the Beowulf manuscript especially is not usually seen by scholars even because it is severely damaged by fire. 
Um, but again, it was not produced at that time. It was kind of labeled for where the provenance is where we find it. Um, and, and they do speculate that some of it was done and completed at Kells when the monks did change, um, flee the Viking, the, the consistent Viking raids that were happening at Iona. So I don't know if that helps. Let me bring you the mic. How long, on average, do you think it would have produced, um, would have taken to produce one of these, like, highly detailed folios? Yeah. So um, a lot of hours go into the completion of a manuscript. And sometimes, too, it depends on, like, the amount of materials that you have on hand. So again, 159 calf skins. Nobody goes out and slaughters 159 calves or cows just for the manuscripts, right? Um, and so instead, it's like you have to kind of hoard the materials, um, do it in piecemeal. Um, and then, of course, the, the most pristine skins are used for these kind of religious texts. Um, this is why in a lot of like heroic texts in England, you can find ones that have natural holes in them, not damage that's done later, um, because they are seen as, as less necessary to have the perfect skin, right, um, versus the, the religious texts. Um, there is someone, I can't remember the number of hours, but someone has talked about the number of hours that it become, is necessary to become a master of craft. Um, how long you have to practice your craft, and it's approximately the same as a PhD, right, with a master's, so it's like seven years of 40 hours a week, like, learning the craft. Um, and so, again, like, to complete a book project like this, I can't even speculate how much time it would take. Um, and again, this is why we have some, there are even some unfinished pages within the Book of Kells, because a lot of times the project is, is put to the side or the illuminator doesn't get to certain things um, ever. And, and so, yeah, lots and lots of work. I am an amateur, but at our <laughs> manuscript workshop that I took place, that took place a few summers ago, I worked for four weeks and reproduced one page very badly. <laughs> <laughs> And the skin was mostly done, mostly. We had to like stretch it and sand it, skin dust. It's a thing. Yeah. Okay, so you mentioned that it takes roughly the time of a PhD to do this and that... Well, to become a master of your craft. Become a master yes. of it. And that... All the writing and everything had a very uniform style, yes. so assuming they all probably had to learn the same thing. Yes. What does the school like look like for this? Like theoretically, how did they get the education or training to yeah. make the pages and make the writings? So um, monasteries usually had a, a dedicated scriptorium, which would be like the area dedicated to creating the manuscripts, and um, of course we know that that. Monks were, of course, literate and schooled that way. The, the university system actually does build out of the monastic system over time. Um, and so it's, it follows some of that same kind of guidance. I will mention, though, that all of the monks are trained to be right-handed, whether or not they are right-handed. Um, there are a couple of reasons for that. One is because, of course, those of you who are left-handed can probably imagine across the page the smearing of everything, right? So when I did the manuscript workshop, we had a lefty who wrote his upside down so that he never dragged the carbon ink across. Um, and also because like right-handedness was seen as righteousness, right? And so they were all trained to be right-handed. And they did work from exemplums, which means a lot of times, right, it was all, and the, the manuscript pages are pre-planned before they start. So sometimes you can see the prickings on the side for ruling um, to keep the lines of text straight. Um, and they do work from like a prepared manuscript already, which is why there are, are often errors, right? Those of us who have copied from someone else know that there's I skip. Um, so sometimes you skip a line or a letter um, and leave those out.
So how would these Irish manuscripts compare to other manuscripts that you've seen since you mentioned that the Irish manuscripts were different than the other ones? Yes, yeah, so there are a lot of like similarities. Um, so I'll just go back earlier here. Um, you can see that they're very similar in a lot of their style. So there's a little bit difference, a lot more symbolism here. We have the lozenge and it's not in this particular chi but they share a lot of the same motifs and patterns. Um, unfortunately, like a lot of the manuscripts I personally work with are not highly illuminated because they are not biblical texts or religious texts. So this one is much fancier. I spent a lot of time when I was there in front of the glass box, so much that the security guard came over and asked me if I was fine. And I was like, yes, I'm a medievalist. I'm not plotting to steal the Book of Kells. Um, but most of the tourists, right, go through pretty quickly. And I guess I was stationed for a while. <laughs> uh, one real quick. Uh, a lot of the um, influence seems Celtic as far as design is mm -hmm. concerned. Is, are there any evidence of Pictish designs in these manuscripts? Oh, yeah. So um, I know in my class we did talk about the differences between some of the Pictish versus Welsh versus um, Scots. I'm probably going to have to take a minute, catch me after, and I'll look through my notes and see. But they, they often do just kind of label it as Celtic, right, in terms of those influences. And there is a lot of, of kind of overlap between that and even the Germanic influences, um, which we see in, in a lot of the comparison. Maybe that was earlier. Nope. Sorry. All of you online, I'm flipping through fast. Ah. Um, and so we do see a lot of, of difference, of kind of similarities in the, the kinds of styles. Yeah. Sure. One last question. So you mentioned the minuscule hand. Is yes. that where the term minuscule comes from? Or was it called that because of the meaning of minuscule? <sighs> Okay, so it's been a while since I've done this, but it, also thinking about minims as well, which are the lines. Um, but minuscule, so it develops later, and it is like um, a smaller, more casual hand. I'll have to look at the, the exact way that that term comes about. Well, let's give Dr. Mauser a round of applause for a very thorough presentation. Yeah.